five two, so maybe we'll we'll get uh, started. So I had people who had asked to say something tonight. So I've got uh, David Lee. You're still on. Yeah, uh, yes, I am. Yeah, um, we have uh, uh, some th a few photos from Edmonton. Um, mm -hmm. Randy, uh, you wanted to say some words. Uh, Malcolm and uh, Chris Gaynor, are there any updates that you would like to give tonight? Maybe hearing them. Um, and Sorry, then there's anybody uh, else. Mm, sorry. Yeah, not, there's not very much to say. They're still proceeding. Okay. I'll promote okay, the no uh, astronomy to... cafe mugs as well. Oh, right. Yes. And, um, and we can give a brief update on what we're, uh, what's happening with that so far, too. Um, does anybody else have anything for this evening? Okay. Uh, if something comes up, just uh, let me know at some uh, point, either through chat or just break in on the conversation. Um, so, David, would you like to start off with? Uh, oh, I did you? Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh yeah. So okay, um, I've got a few things here. Um, I think I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna start off with something on a lighter note. Um, let me just see. So I don't know if people noticed uh, the note I sent uh, on the weekend about uh, uh, a, uh, a series on uh, Netflix, but uh, I'll just bring this up. I, th I think I had read about this and I had forgotten about it and maybe Laurie might know a little bit more about it, but uh, uh, our Plaskett Dome is uh, kind of featured in it and there's uh, some interesting things that are happening there. Oh, wrong one, sorry. Are you seeing something here? Seeing super pups. <laughs> yeah, so so that's that's the series that was shot here in 2020, I think it was. And you can see a very familiar scene of the inside of the Plasket. And uh, you can see that there, there are these uh, special people here uh, going after an alien that you can't see here, a small alien. And there's um, uh, a series of dogs that have these kind of kind of superpowers. So that's the premise of it, right? Uh, it's filmed all over Vancouver Island. So there's uh, there's uh, location shots from uh, Duncan, from Shamanus. Uh, you'll see uh, even uh, downtown and the North Park area downtown, you'll see that as well. There, there's an area ne right next to the church that's on the uh, near, near North Park. And uh, there's uh, it, it's a scene of a, a place called Jam Records. And there's a kind of a funky um, 70s kind of guy who owns a record store there. Anyways, that, that's all part of the story. But um, I, 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 a big, big, huge warning. Uh, it is overtly cute. So if you don't like that sort of thing, don't watch it. Uh, but uh, I, I, I had a, a good time watching it, uh, except I got really confused because I knew the locales, except they didn't stitch together properly. Uh, in, in filmmaking, that doesn't really matter because your audience isn't supposed to know these real scenes. <laughs> so uh, I don't know, has anybody seen it? Or anybody watched it? No. Well, I lasted to catch about two minutes. Oh, you lasted about two minutes. I, okay, I, I got to see the dome, yeah. but the talking dogs just didn't do it for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of other uh, inaccurate astronomical stuff in it. You, you, gotta, you gotta realize what it is, uh, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it's good if you have kids, though, I would assume. It, it opens with a uh, fellow on a uh, small boat looking through his uh, Dubsonian. Yes. Yes. <laughs> with, with lights all around him as well. <laughs> but, uh, but, but you'll notice he, he, did, um, he did admonish his grandson by telling him that uh, an app isn't going to do. He should really look through the telescope. So at least he said that. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, just just as a as a kind of to follow through with that um if anyone knows dave balaam who is uh who is the meteor 
the meteor hunter up at the center of the universe and and actually has a huge amount to do with the telescope and everything was one of the the kind of the advisor background writers that for this thing over the past oh, I don't know three years or something like that and um and he was in on some of the some of the shoot the shoots and and that kind of thing and then he said he was really disappointed because when they put it all together they they like they as as you said david they didn't put things kind of in the right order and well and that, it that's really a, kind of messed up things and he said he was a little bit disappointed in the actual thing it, that it's, ended it, up but it, it's contextual uh it's supposed to be in the <laughs> states it is an imaginary yeah. place so you you have yeah. to give uh, the filmmakers that uh, that much uh they're not really meant to uh stitch together in our vision because we we have prior knowledge right yeah, yeah some anyway, people think just... victoria is an imaginary place That's well it could be it could be <laughs> well, the dogs yeah. don't speak either right they, they well don't... these ones do <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah you, you gotta, gotta gotta keep your eye out on some of these films that are coming out for victoria scenes we were watching one of those hallmark mysteries the other day and i was looking at it and i said hey that's cattle point <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough it was yeah 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 exactly well anyway. to be to be anything that it gets that gets the dome into you know in front of in front of kids great no problem yeah so there Ab you go. Ab absolutely so so the next thing i wanted to bring up was um uh we've relaunched uh, astronomy day this is our first um uh, in-person public outreach event for almost two years, I guess. Uh, but we we met, a uh, few of us met, uh, I think 14 or 15, 15 of us or so, uh, met uh, last Saturday just to uh, get this thing going. And uh, we've reactivated a number of the, the normal activities that we do there. And I have specified the leads for each of these areas. So if anybody's interested in volunteering for Astronomy Day, uh, let, let either me or Laurie know. Uh, there is uh, three events. Uh, there's the event that starts off uh, with the uh, museum, uh, and we, I think we're going to have it run between 10 and 3 or thereabouts. Uh, and then in the evening, or well, actually, no, in between that time, uh, there is a national event that is going to be broadcast across Canada. And uh, Lori, we don't know yet whether we're at the beginning or the end of that, uh, but uh, it is lunar themed. So I'm actually hoping that we can, it doesn't matter whether it's dark or not, we should be able to catch a view of the of the moon. So um, I'll be probably asking for volunteers to kind of help help us do that. Uh, so that's the second event. And then the, the third event, of course, is uh, at the FDAO. And uh, we have lots of things uh, up there uh, uh, planned. Um, uh, Chris, 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 you're, you're, you're joining us for, for uh, maybe a book signing or something like that. Um, and uh, the usual kind of events, like we're hoping to have the Plaskett open, uh, maybe have a few telescopes uh, out on the deck. And uh, yeah, it, it's kind of like our in-person reopening. Now, uh, for the most part, this is what we believe will happen. Uh, but of course, uh, subject to COVID, uh, anything can happen, I guess. Uh, but right now, that's what our plan is. So if anybody is uh, interested uh, in helping out, uh, just let us know. Uh, many of you have already come forward, uh, but we probably still need a fair a fair number of people to pull this off. And and Lori, did you want to add anything? And we need help uh, up at the FDO as well. Um, yes, we're, uh, as I, I think I said before, our meeting uh, with the NRC is on Wednesday uh, this week, at which time we will be given probably a yes or no as to whether we can, we can open in person up at the center. Um, we're hoping it's a yes. <laughs> and we're going with that, but we also need to uh, know that there could be that the evening program uh, could revert back to a virtual program. So we're already, we've got that kind of all in, you know, kind of in background to try to try to do that. Um, and we certainly could uh, use some help up at the center. I'm, we're hoping that people will, um, you know, will migrate back up there for uh, some of the some of the time, if it's a nice night, we'll be putting up telescopes on the deck. Um, and even Sherry Butner has said that she would open up the 16 inch um, that got fixed and was was just going to start to be working before we shut down. So it was uh, so hopefully we'll get that back up and working again. Um, and uh, uh, 
we have a, a limited number of people in that there probably will only be about 100 visitors on the hill uh, and then the then the volunteers are, are extra on that uh, so it will be a it will be a smaller group but still fine and we can we can manage we can manage groups in different places because we are going to have to pull down the numbers of people like in the dome at one time and the numbers of people in the auditorium at any time that that kind of thing so lots of things going on but we could certainly use uh, your help um, and um, uh, just call just email me call me whatever you'd like to do and let me know thank you yeah thank and you. and actually with respect to COVID uh, I just want people to know that uh, even though there is no um, uh, mandatory masking uh, I would advise people that depending on your own comfort level uh, by all means wear a mask if you feel you need to so there, there's no reason you should feel compelled not to wear a mask if, if you choose to, just so you know. Well, Dr. Tam recommends that everyone wears masks in crowded indoor settings. Mm -hmm. I, I hope people will use their discretion. I mean, I still wear my mask when I go shopping, uh, but I choose to, right? So I don't expect everybody else to. Um, so, but yeah, so so that that's that's the thing about COVID. It could uh, it could turn just like a dime. Uh, we have no idea what's going to happen in the next month. Um, so the, the very, very last thing before we leave the, that topic, uh, or uh, leaving that topic, I should say, uh, there are two SIGs uh, uh, this week. Uh, the beginner SIG is tomorrow night, and I think there's some, uh, an, at least one new member uh, starting tomorrow, so we will welcome them. Uh, and then on Thursday, we have EAA. So those are the two SIGs for uh, this week. So, so, so you said, Dave, that everyone wants volunteers, and you know I'm willing to volunteer. But uh, how do we know who we should volunteer for, and where we? Yeah. So, if you if you're at all interested, let me know. Uh, I will send you a list of uh, known activities uh, as it appears right now. And I'll already tell you that we we will need somebody for the national event. And I think I mentioned that to you. If you're willing to yeah. come down to uh, the center or something like that, we could maybe get you working on uh, some of the scopes that are down there, if, if that's something you're comfortable doing. So, uh, well, I was I was speaking as a as a in general, how does one? Oh yeah, well that's one of the things, uh, and then there's other things as well. Uh, if you want to get more involved at the front end, uh, the welcome desk is always a good place to start, and uh, a lot a lot of people start there. There's there's even um, a telescope. Uh, uh, show and tell that uh, Bill is arranging. So maybe you might want to be involved in that. So um, it's the usual stuff that we've done. I know it's not usual for you because you haven't been with us, but for everybody else, uh, it's kind of the usual stuff. Um, but if you're at all interested, just let me know. I'll send you a list of the act current activities. David, show the uh, spreadsheet again and just I can uh, do that. show I can the... do that as well. Yeah. And, and Dave, even if you just want to show up to give uh, some of the people who are there a bathroom break. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We need, uh -oh. Oh, what? yeah, we need people. So you you can see the um, the activities here. They're in green. The ones that are confirmed are in green, and then the these are the lead <laughs> the leads, the names of the leads. So for instance, uh, Jeff is uh, responsible for the welcome desk, and uh, there'll be a number of things that will need to be done there. Uh, telescope show and tell. Uh, Joe's gonna do the astrophotography thing. And, and by the way, we had anticipated that we would get our display going, but for for the sake of um, uh, sort of conserving money, because we know that we're gonna need money uh, to deal with the hybrid situation, uh, we're choosing uh, not to get them printed and we're just gonna do uh, digital displays of the images. So um, uh, Joe's responsible for that. Uh, Lori needs some help on the uh, children's uh, crafts. I don't know. What do you need, Lori, for that? Um, well, I need somebody to be a lead um, on that, actually, um, because I'm going to be doing uh, some other work. Um, like I'm going to be kind of the museum liaison and logistics on the on the night so on the day. So I I won't be able to do this. But if if there's anybody that would like to uh, be on a table, usually what we do is just have have um, have things the kids can do, and uh, and we would need. Uh, we would need a lead and then we would need probably about four volunteers during the day to help out with that. I have all the all the stuff up at the center of the universe. So you you don't have to you don't have to really be 
thinking of all your own activities or anything. We've got all that stuff. I just need somebody to do that because I'm going to be somewhere else this year. We also do have Science Venture who have uh, agreed to come on and that will be uh, another uh, another like family oriented children, child oriented um, program. Mm -hmm. um, so if there is, I mean, uh, really, honestly, if there's nobody that wants to take the lead on this, then we just simply won't have a table. I mean, it's as, it's as simple as that this year. So, yeah, I mean, all, all these activities are um, uh, dependent upon whether we have adequate volunteers yeah. to uh, sort of look after them. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, Je Jeff, you had a question. Uh, it wasn't a question, just just a comment. Um, I'm new with the welcome desk, so anybody who wants to help out there, uh, please just uh, shoot uh, your email to me in the chat, and I'll just take it down and uh, I'll get in touch with you. Yeah, that's right. So Jeff, Jeff is the lead on the welcome table. Okay, uh, responsible lighting. Uh, uh, Dave, uh, you're going to get a hold of Dorothy, I'm assuming, because Dorothy has a yeah. lot of materials. Well, she's got the display boards. I have a few odds and sods, uh, but it's it's fairly straightforward. Okay. Could could I add something here? Sure. So to point out the display board is actually two sided, three panels on both sides, and ideally we have a person on each side, and one side is about light. So it's how light has been studied from time zero, well, starting with Galileo, and. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's an astronomy section and light and life on the other side. So it's science completely on one side. And the other three panels have to do with light and living organisms, the uh, responsible lighting, all the good directed directions that Dave has provided uh, for responsible lighting, which draws people in. So it would be really helpful to have, don't you think, Dave, to have a have another person there? I don't. I could stay for a while, but I don't know if either of us are going to be there all day. Yeah, and, I, I, I don't know. Don't know how. We, we, it, like I say, it would help to have someone to spell us off periodically. But yeah. the way that the way the setup is down there, typically, it's really tough to have visitors on both sides of that board because. Uh, there's really on one side that the public walks past unless you can con them to walk around the other side. Yeah, it's just a layout. Although, yeah, the, there's the 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 um, the corridor side you might say, but the other side which backs onto the astronomy displays what Dave was talking. David yeah. Lee was talking about earlier. Uh, people are milling around there and. He, if there's a person on either side, we can pull them over to the other side to make the astronomers realize that they can do something about improving lighting and make the and help reduce the climate change. And and the other way around, that if there are people are concerned about environmental stuff rushing by, but oh, they can find out about what they can see in the sky by inviting them around the other side. So it helps to have both sides because at least assuming we're set up more or less the way we have been in the past in the museum yeah. both sides are ex accessible and people can circulate around them and what's backed what they're backed on to is quite different so yeah well, i mean so, yeah, so Dorothy, first timers too i i guess you would probably would expect to to see what is there what we have to offer and go move around and then next time you'll know what you'd like to yeah so Dor move on or add or to yeah so Dor Dor dorothy at the at the check-in meeting which is going to be on the 19th uh we're going to probably look at the floor plan and yeah. um i don't know what the restrictions are right now like um Lori and i are speaking to kim tomorrow so we're going to find out if there's any kind of further restrictions on the space uh but more or less, we have the space that was in the uh, PDF that I sent around to everybody. Um, how we arrange it is totally up to us. We don't have to do it exactly the same way that we've done it in the past. Just, yeah, just well, so that the panel know. is is two sided, so it, it we lose one side or the other, and we certainly keep the the responsible lighting side if that's the only one we could have, but it would be unfortunate, I think, because the other side does add to that and draws people into the mm -hmm. other things we do. 
we we have dropped uh, some activities, so there may not be a problem in doing that, uh, mm -hmm. Dorothy. If you want to do that, yeah, we may be able to put it on its side. On the layout. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all going to depend on the layout and how the public flows through the space. Yeah, exactly. Now, uh, we normally would have a planetarium uh, or a Starry Night um, kind of tool out on the floor uh, on a big TV. Now, uh, Bruno, who normally does that, uh, doesn't really want to do it this year. So uh, Ben Dorman from the FDAO was looking into maybe finding somebody who might do that. Mm -hmm. But if there's but if there's anybody here that wants to do it, that's yeah. familiar with Stellarium, uh, certainly let us know. Uh, so solar observing, this this is um, a traditional thing. Um, uh, Sid normally leads a group of people at the front of the museum to sort of draw people in, and they'll be using solar scopes. So uh, uh, if you if that kind of uh, uh, is interesting to you, then please uh, let Sid know. Uh, we typically have both white solar and uh, hydrogen alpha. Uh, the club owns a number of hydrogen alpha scopes. And I think the FDAO said that they would loan us the CU uh, new Coronado as well. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you have like a white solar filter that uh, is safe, um, uh, let us know. And if, if, if you want to sort of uh, volunteer for doing that. Uh, Nathan is going to get a bunch of people together to uh, sort of arm the Ask uh, an Astronomer group. So we're expecting him to maybe talk to uh, people at the DAO and also at the University of Victoria. And of course, he's going to be uh, one of the people uh, sort of manning the, the Ask the Astronomer area. Uh, Randy, I don't know what ideas you have for speakers, but... Uh, well, I I'm haven't so uh, asked yet, but is the two speakers... Uh, is, is there a reason not to have three or four? Uh, I think just for logistics i i, I guess uh okay. we can certainly talk about it you know i mean Depends let me, how let me see are. uh who, who i can uh drum up but um okay. i guess what i was thinking is uh one speaker an hour with about 45 uh 15 minutes between for getting people out and in okay uh yeah let, let's continue to talk let's see who you come up with uh, okay. as well um, so Ben Ben Dorman is kind of leading the display for the friends of the DAO. I'm not exactly sure what he's going to bring, uh, um, but uh, yeah, he, he'll we'll bring we'll bring the um, the uh, the goes the VR goes, and have our normal kind of stuff up in the front with our with our um, planetary buddies and everything like that. So yeah, uh, is is Dennis part of this group? Uh, is he bringing no? Like Dennis VR stuff, is it or? was uh, Dennis is with the NRC. Oh, okay. Okay. Dennis will do the NRC. Yeah. And is he bringing his uh, VR? He'll uh, do his, the Rift VR with it with JWST on it. Okay, so okay. that's the next one here. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I haven't heard anything from Jonathan. So, have you managed to get a hold of Jonathan at Vikai? Uh, no. Uh, no, I haven't. I have. I didn't get today. I mean, I've I've got an email, but I haven't heard anything back. All right. Uh, so uh, Karun has uh, replied to me. So I know that he and his students are are gearing up to develop some astro demos. So that's we're in good shape for that. And uh, Lori, I think you mentioned that David is going to join us as well. Yes. So that could be green. Yep, that could yep. be green. Okay. <laughs> that's green. Yeah. Um, I sent a note to Jim. I haven't heard from him, so I don't know. And uh, Gary, Gary, are you online? I don't know if Gary's on. I'm here. Yep. Did yep, you did you try did you try to get a hold of uh, Nigel at all? Not yet, but it's in my calendar to do tomorrow morning at nine thirty. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Being the PM that I am, I wanted you to have a date. <laughs> all right. Okay. So that that's that's all the activities. Um, uh, we you know which ones are active right now and the ones that are coming online. So uh, just express your interest, and we'll put you to work. And the other thing I was going to say, David, you're um, circulating most of this information on the RASC VIC list. Is that correct? I I have a list of people that express interest. Right. I didn't want okay. I didn't want to I didn't want to spam everybody. So okay. uh, if if you express an interest, you go on to my distribution list. Okay, so that's if if anybody here has not already been receiving those emails, please reach out to David Lee and yeah, and I'll add you to the list. list. Yeah, All right. absolutely. Thanks, David. Thank, Great. You. Thank you very much. Thanks, David, for taking the lead on this. You know, no problem. Very much appreciated.
Um, any more questions for David or are we good on that one? Okay, Great, well, Dave, you. if you're ready, we could uh, show the uh, Edmonton photos. Yeah, you want to pop that up? I Just a, a little bit of background. Um, this is uh, my, my good friend, uh, Arnold Rivera, who's taken some uh, rec a recent image uh, of, of the sun uh, from Edmonton. And he's using a Lunt 80 millimeter uh, hydrogen alpha on a Los Mandy mount with a ZWO camera. Uh, so this was, was a, the first shot is an overall shot and showing a couple of active areas that, that you can see in the text beside it, AR 12975 and 12976. Um, yes, yes. At the, the one at the top, so if you go to the next one, this has the, the identified from a uh, spaceweather.com uh, photograph. So you can see which ones are. 29, 77, 75, and 76. And those are the ones that produced the solar flare on the 31st uh, and, and uh, hit us with a, a CME. Unfortunately, it didn't extend far enough south that we could see aurora, but there were some aurora if you were uh, probably 50 degrees and north, uh, but uh, we missed them. <laughs> and then the next one is, is a close up of the uh, the two, the one on the left is the close-up of the one that exhibited the X 1.3 glass flare, and the one on the bot on the right is uh, is interesting because of all of the, the filaments that are associated with that active region on the sun. So the sun is being pretty active these days. So keep our eyes on the aurora watch because we may be getting some if we keep getting more of these sizes of uh, sunspots coming around. Great, thanks. I'm just going to uh, flip back a couple here because I just want to mention um, to uh, some of the newer members here what you're seeing here. So this is a oh, yeah. uh, telescope that looks specifically for the alpha line of the hydrogen emission. So you, this allows you to see prominences and other details around the perimeter of the sun, as well as certain surface details. Yeah. Um, this space weather uh, image is more what you would see with a neutral density filter. So you see the sunspots with their umbra and penumbra. So you'll notice that um, the hydrogen alpha doesn't tend to see these, these as such large regions. I just wanted to point that out. You notice we're seeing yeah. the two and, smaller and ones and we're not seeing such a, it's not kind of gray around there. It, it looks more regular sun color. And then later on in the week, uh, Arnold posted an, Im an image in, uh, in calcium K line, but it's pretty dim. So I didn't bother forwarding it at this point. Right. Um, so, and that's what, um, and so that was when um, David was talking about uh, have, uh, SID having telescopes out there. We'll have both types of telescopes, um, yeah. hopefully so that you can see both those types of things. Assuming, first of all, it's clear on astronomy day, which would be very nice. And that there are some nice sunspots to view as well. Um, it's been pretty quiet sunspot wise for the past few years. We, and now we we're could, starting to creep back up into a maximum. We could, we could print some of those images out, tape them to the end of a telescope, yeah. it would be really bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Laura, you have a question. Yes, I was wondering if someone could talk to me a little bit about those lovely filaments that were on the, uh, I guess the first, um, the second, the second one, where yeah. there was a big long filament by the uh, the lower, the lower left um, uh, picture, not that one. The one yeah, before, but yeah. that one. That one, like yeah, right, these. those yeah, those long filaments. Somebody know about those? I've read up on them, and I can't those... say I remember all of the explanation for them. I think some of them are, are the edge on view of some of the corona uh, loops or coronal arches that come off the sun related to the spots that would normally we would see as prominences. But when you're looking at them edge on, you're seeing that uh, slightly cooler gas, which is why it shows up a little less bright. Dave, Dave that sounds like a, uh, an upcoming talk. Uh, I'm not any expert on that <laughs> at all. <laughs> Maybe I'll uh, have a look at that and see if I can uh, put together some stuff on that because I do have some books on it. Um, a lot of one of the things to realize about the sun is it's um, 
as far as we know, because we, you know, we can study it from here and have managed to get a bit closer to it. But there's still, I think, a fair amount not known about how, how the sun works and the stars work. But it is magnetically very active. So um, what happened, although it's because it's a ball of gas, you've got to think of a whole bunch of individual strands of magnetic um, magnetism. So not just like the Earth having essentially a pole, you know, from, so we have a North magnetic pole and a South magnetic pole. Um, the sun has many of those. And a lot of the time they can get twirled in a knot. And actually it's believed the sunspot is basically what we can see from here when the uh, hotter material is getting somewhat blocked. So you get a little bit of a cooler area um, at the surface of the sun. So, uh, and I think some of those um, uh, other things you can see with hydrogen alpha are showing that as well. Disruptions, basically, the, the, the surface of the sun is not a smooth, continuous thing as it might appear. Randy, did you want to? Oh, I was just hoping to get to do the next element because it's a very good segue to what I'm about to show off. Sure, we could, uh, yeah, in fact, you are next on the list. So we'll, Ooh -ha. we'll do that. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, maybe we'll try and do some more on solar viewing if we can actually uh, see some sun spots and some sun later on. Yeah, one of one of the things to remember is that we have have only recently come out of the solar minimum, and and the solar minimum occurs when the the gross magnetic field of the sun switches polarity uh, about once every eleven years, and before it does it, and just after it does it. Uh, as, and, and this is not like it's a single magnet, it's a, a conglomeration of magnetic fields. Uh, before it does it, the sunspot activity really goes down. The, geom the magnetic activity on the sun seems to decline a bit. And then when you flip over, you start seeing these sunspots. So we're now starting to head to, towards a solar maximum over the next five, six years. And so we're going to see more and more sunspots as we go. And we're probably going to see more prominence as time goes by. So it should be interesting to view. Yeah. Could be, Chris, if you're going to be doing a talk on this, which would be lovely, could you explain um, magnetic ropes? Like to me, you know, you get magnetism coming from a barred magnet, but the idea of having a rope of magnet, of magnetized lines or something like that, it just baffles me. You know, it'd be nice to learn a bit about that. Sure. Well, it'd be a good thing to learn about because yeah, I can't say I can explain it right now either. So. <laughs> yeah. But well, remember, you're, you're talking about highly ionized particles that are moving around in a magnetic field and creating their own magnetic fields as we go. Depends on their velocity and direction and everything. So it's it's a very, very complicated picture. But I think we can probably get some inf more information on it. Yeah. And, I get, and again, I think it's not, you know, we've tried to put, well, not me, obviously, but uh, experts have tried to piece together what's actually happening there. And, you know, it seems like that, you know, kind of makes sense and would explain it, but it may not be the entire picture. Yeah. Just like this solar cycle, um, there one of there are some people who are thinking there's a much longer solar cycle that overlays the shorter one, yeah. and so you get trends in the cycles. And we've been having this this trend of actually not very active solar cycles in the last. The, some of the most active ones I think were in the 1970s, and it's the mm -hmm. ones since the peaks since then have been lower. So it's, you know, to be, be aware of those things. Lori. <laughs> Maybe we can get somebody from the solar port, the Parker solar probe to come and speak to us too, um, online. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be really good. So yeah. we have had presentations in the past and they're, they're on our YouTube. Oh, with Parker? No, on solar, oh, on sol solar okay. features okay. and, uh, okay. and yeah. activity. Okay, Randy, you can take it away. So um, first thing is, yes, one of the great things I find about Astro Cafe is it gives you a motivation to dig a bit deeper into these uh, topics. And uh, Chris and or Dave or anybody, I would love to figure out more, to understand more about uh, those uh magnetic ropes and what's happening down there. So I highly encourage you to uh, try that. That would be very good for me. Um, 
anyway, uh, in the news this weekend were these wonderful photos from March 30 by a uh, Tofino photographer, Alex Talman, and I invited him to give a talk. And he was really, really pleased to be invited. And then we got a um, <clears throat> an email today just before the um, the Astro Cafe that he got this big photo opportunity. So he'll come and show these pictures off uh, and we can ask him questions about his evening uh, and, and what his equipment and such is. But uh, here are just some of his pictures. They're just amazing. And when I talked to him, he was saying he, you know, he's lived in Northwest Territories and in Yukon. And he says the colors were really unlike anything he had seen before. Um, anyway, I was hoping to, you know, from the buzz of his talk, then go on and talk a bit about how the Aurora works. But uh, again, we'll see him soon. We'll see him uh, in one of these coming weeks. Just know that uh, he's got some very good photo skills and uh, the Aurora really decided to come far south last week. Anyway, um, this is our club's um, sunspotter. Lovely, simple, simple telescope. The sunlight goes through this primary lens, bounces off one mirror, second mirror, third mirror, goes through a secondary lens and then projects onto this piece of paper. And uh, here is a picture of the same thing, but I've enhanced the contrast a bit. And you see these uh, sunspots here and here and here. And then when you compare to exactly the same website that Dave was showing, um, they had the solar dynamic observatories picture and they identify these things. And uh, it's really wonderful that we get to see these sunspots with such simple equipment. Uh, and we'll have this set up at the uh, International Astronomy Day because it's already in the plan that it's going to be clear that day, right? Anyway, uh, as we were just talking about, the sunspots go up and down in uh, occurrence and frequency. And uh, after a few years of it being quite low, it's now up to the kind of level that we were at in 2016. And it's going well above the prediction. Now, how good is the prediction? I don't know. That's what uh, Chris was talking about, how you have this kind of super cycle. But this so far is heading to be a higher one. And I guess one of the things I just love about the sunspot story is that we can trace these measurements back to Galileo. Uh, and it's one of those things that amateur uh, astronomers are perfectly capable of adding to the database. Um, and as we go through time, you see that there are these big variations. The Maunder minimum uh, appears to be a real thing and related to the climate. The important thing is that the amount of solar radiation that hits the Earth is in a complicated way related to the number of sunspot observations. And so we are coming off a quiet period and going into a busy period. What does that have to do with, uh, with Aurora, I hear you ask. And it's because associated with those sunspots, those kind of mildly colder regions on the moon, where you have these magnetic ropes coming out, you also get every once in a while these burps, these huge uh, they're called coronal mass ejections. Often they're um, called CMEs. Uh, how big are they? I heard somewhere that they are 10 to the 12 grams and a super tanker is 10 to the nine grams. So think of a thousand super tankers of mostly electrons and protons going across space towards the earth. Gary, you have a hand up. Yes, I do. Um, one thing, whoever's going to give this talk on the, on the sun, and there's another feature of the sun is that's quite 
fascinating is the fact that it rings like a bell. I don't know how many people know that, but it has all these vibrational modes and you can, I don't know how fast they go and probably not very fast, but it'd be nice to understand that too. Imagine the sun ringing like a bell, like that just on. I really want to hear this talk. Okay, so every once in a while, more common when there are more sunspots, there are CMEs that rush away from the sun. Sometimes, just by random chance, they are aimed at the Earth. And then we come to the Earth's magnetic field. So this is a magnetic phenomenon going on over at the sun. And then we have independently our own magnetic situation. The Earth in the, uh, and this is stuff that I do study, uh, at the core mantle boundary, you have this flow of conductive boiling liquid. It's, it's uh, you know, pot of chicken soup, but it's conductive and it creates its own magnetohydrodynamic self, self, energized dynamo, something like that. Anyway, it creates the Earth's magnetic field and it's quite complicated down at the source, but by the time you get 6,000 kilometers away from there, then it has the geometry of a bar magnet, a dipole, and it would look nice and symmetrical, except that it's getting swept away by the solar wind. And it really is wind, okay? Wind is matter that is moving along. The sun is pushing out matter. It happens to be charged. And when charges move, they create a magnetic field. But basically, it is bouncing against the Earth's uh, magnetic field. And uh, charges do not like to cross magnetic lines. They like to move along magnetic lines whole bunch of physics there. But um, one thing I want you to see is there's these two kind of holes in the north and in the south where you can actually follow the lines right in towards the earth. So um, you've got these kind of areas of lower magnetic field which are trapping uh, ions, plasma, which are Interestingly, they're mostly Earth-sourced ions, okay? They, they, these, don't, these are not solar wind that have been trapped. These are mostly uh, particles from the upper atmosphere that are trapped in the Van Allen radiation belts. But you have this huge um, region around the Earth, which is being swept away by the solar wind. And when the... Uh, solar wind has one of these CMEs, these coronal mass ejections that bangs against the Earth, then it starts wobbling the, the uh, magnetic field around and particles come in. And here's something, you know what? I remember in university learning this and I had a hell of a time finding a diagram about it. People don't, when they talk about the aurora, they don't talk about one of the things that I find the most interesting. So if you have a charged particle moving in a magnetic field, it will go around and around in a spiral centered along the lines of magnetic field. If those lines get closer and closer, which is similar to saying that the field is getting stronger, then it actually, um, puts a force on those particles in the opposite direction. So what happens is they will move towards the Earth as the field gets stronger, as you get the closer to the center of the Earth. Um, and then at some point, the, uh, they, they bounce back. It turns into a magnetic mirror. And so what happens is you've got a particle. Don't worry about how it gets started, but once it gets going, it moves along, bounces somewhere in the atmosphere in the north, then goes along and then bounces in the south and it goes back and forth. And they actually do these experiments where they go to Churchill, for example, and they throw some 
plasma into the sky. I don't know how they do it, but then they actually can see it in Antarctica. And then it comes back and forth. They, they can actually see these particles going back and forth. But the um, higher the energy, the closer they get to the surface of the Earth. So the lower energy ones are way up, up high, and the more and more energy, the closer and closer you get to the surface of the Earth. And so what happens is, you know, when they're thousands of kilometers up, nothing happens because there's no atmosphere. But when you take a look at the composition of the atmosphere, it gets more and more rarefied as you go up. This is on a logarithmic scale. So, you know, there's vastly less atmosphere at 500 kilometers than there is, say, at 100 kilometers. But what you have there is atomic oxygen. It's not even O2, the stuff that you and I like to breathe. This is just single oxygen. And when one of these protons or electrons bangs against it, then it will make an electron fly away. And then when the electron comes back, if it's way up high and it's not very energetic, then it will make red lines. It make the lower energy red colors come off. As you move, as the particles get more energetic, then you're starting to bang off the uh, lower uh, more more energetic electrons of the oxygen and the eye is much more sensitive to uh green than it is to red plus there's many more oxygen particles here at you know 200 kilometers than there is up at 500 so that's why the green of the aurora are really really prominent and then you get to the blues and the violets, and that's one of the things that Alex uh, just was saying. He's never seen the violet aurora before, but that's only when you get really energetic particles that are coming way down below 100 kilometers uh, height above the, the, the ground. Uh, that's when you, you start getting the nitrogen emissions because the, there is no more or very little oxygen compared to the, the, the nitrogen once you get down to the lower levels of the atmosphere. Uh, I think that's it. Oh no, it's not it. So in preparation for this, I watched a uh, YouTube, a, a lecture from last year uh, by this guy, Bob Lysek. And I loved it. Fantastic lecture. Look it up if you want more information. One of the things is he's been in this field for 40 years and he is not scared to say, I don't know. He says so many things are so complicated and we've been trying our darndest to figure it out and we still don't know. And uh, it was very refreshing to see a scientist speak like that. It's, it's, it's not done at a very high level. It was, it was you know, for, for a popular audience, but um, the, the, the science was definitely in there. Anyway, his, his conclusion slide is that uh, the aurora is a complex interplay between sun and earth magnetosphere. That's what I hope I showed you. Um, anyway, solar activity, particles, whatever. What I want you to see is this. He says, everywhere you see this statement that particles are blasted from the sun, some plunge through earth's magnetic field and make bright northern lights. And he said, that's like 10% of the story. Most of the particles are Earth particles in the Van Allen radiation belts that were dislodged by the CME crashing against the magnetosphere. So think of a, you know, your broom banging against the, uh, the, the carpet and you get puffs of dust. It's the dust that's on the carpet that, that you're, you're, you're seeing. Um, so most of the particles that create the aurora are stored in the magnetic tail. Oh yeah, that's that whole area behind the earth too, the Van Allen belts and the, and the magneto tail and released when it collapses due to the release of giant plasma cloud CMEs from the sun. So that was a revelation to me. And that's where I'm gonna stop. <laughs> it, that, that's really interesting, Randy, because uh... My experience with uh, with aurora, because being out observing around Edmonton, we would almost always see aurora of some kind or another, and and we do know that with some of the geomagnetic events that come from the sun, 
you do get that purple aurora. Uh, and usually when that happens, it, it's, it's coronal aurora. It's straight overhead. From, certainly from Edmonton, it was almost always straight overhead. But the most energetic storm I think I've ever seen anything of was I was driving back from skiing at Jasper one night and the whole sky went red. And I mean, literally, we stopped the car, we got out and it was horizon to horizon red from Aurora. And that was the, the solar magnetic storm that took out the power grid in New York and Quebec. No kidding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I guess it was right all southern horizon to northern horizon. It was absolutely red. Oh Wait, boy. Yeah. That is cool. I Dwayne, you got aurora. your hand up. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead and uh, finish. Okay, I have some aurora trivia. Some people say they can hear the auroras, but a uh, scientific paper I read one time said, no, you're not actually hearing it the electrical fields of the aurora are actually um, interacting with the cells in your, in your skin and you hear it doing, that's what you're hearing is not something coming in through your ears, yeah. but something that's actually happening to your skin on your head. G Gary, I heard it once. And that was yeah. back in about 1970, 78. I was up in, uh, in the Yukon at the top of McMillan Pass and it was Minus 50 outside, and I happened to stick my head out that night, and I heard the aurora. Okay, there you go. There's a crackle or something like that, apparently. And, and his skin promptly froze. <laughs> Dwayne. <laughs> That's what he heard. His skin was freezing. He didn't hear any aurora. <laughs> oh, Randy, thank you for a great explanation awesome. in a way that I can understand. I, uh, I remember one time I used to live uh, in Edmonton and around Edmonton and I was driving northeast from Camrose to Lloydminster I think there's a road that goes straight and I was in this old truck and the lights went out and I was halfway there and I just followed the northern lights <laughs> that was kind of guiding me the whole way didn't really light the road up too much but it was pretty consistent and uh and I swear I'd heard them, but I'm glad you told me, Gary. I wasn't hearing them. I was hearing my own skin crackle. So that's <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, there was times we at, out at Blackfoot, east of Ed, Edmonton, that it would, the aurora would be so right that you could read a newspaper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I did have a question, Randy, and that was, and, and this comes from things I've seen from Hollywood, so I have no comprehension of it. But you talked at, at a moment there about like the, uh, the, the core spinning and that spinning causes the mag magnetic effect that comes out the poles which allows the earth to interact with the sun's corona my question is if that core did not spin would we lose magnetic field and therefore atmospheric control okay so first of all it's not spinning it's convection so it's um heat being dissipated by the uh, the nickel iron fluid moving up and then the cooler part going down. Okay, so this is just part of the heat engine of the Earth, uh, and it, it's it's not like the um, outer core is spinning relative to the rest of the body of the Earth. It's 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 a more like cells. And really think chicken soup. It's very complicated, very random. In terms of uh, the rally number, it's up at like a thousand. It's much more, um, much more chaotic than uh, say the sun, which is very regular. It reverses every eleven years. On a, it's a it's a it's a quite ordered system. The Earth, although the motion is at the speed of centimeters a day. It still is uh, highly chaotic. Um, now, when the field dies down, which it does, it's a chaotic system, then it either wakes up normal polarity north up, or it wakes up uh, reverse polarity. But in the period in between, then there's this multiple a uh, magnetic field instead of a dipole field. So it doesn't look like a bar magnet. It's, it's much more complicated. And uh, during that time, absolutely, we are not protected from the solar wind. 
Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And, and you may that ask is why that is, is why Mars doesn't have an atmosphere is because it doesn't have the dynamo, and right. the atmosphere is just stripped away. The field has been dying down slightly over the last two thousand years. We get from archaeomagnetic measurements, and that is a necessary but not sufficient condition for the beginning of a reversal. But it takes about 10,000 years for the reversal. So not an issue that we have to worry about. It's nothing like in Hollywood where, you know, it dies and then civilizations fall apart. Uh, but it is definitely consistent with being the beginning of the next reversal. And we're way overdue. The last one was 780,000 years ago. And the median duration is 100,000 years. So we're definitely due for the next one. And because it's so chaotic, we don't really understand what causes its reversal or how it reverses. Like it's not an interplay with, with temperature from solar flares or anything. It's, it's totally internal. This is an internal effect, yeah. Now we're actually on my subject. This is stuff that I studied. <laughs> <laughs> Ask the expert. <laughs> Thanks very much. And, and, and what's great, Andy, Andy? Is, is, is the interaction between those two is, is the great part of it. We, we, get, we get these sky events that are, that are coming from the bowels of the earth, which is really quite amazing. So, Randy, is it actually the, the movement of ionized particles and charge in the Earth's mantle or that generates the, the field? Because you have to have a flow of electrical current to generate a magnetic field. It's electrons. It, it's, it's a conductive iron nickel alloy that electrons are able to flow through like in a wire. Yeah. And they flow because there is a, you're moving material through a magnetic field. So the same way if you move a wire, this is what happens at every hydroelectric dam is you're moving a wire through, you know, a coil through a magnetic field. And that's what creates the electricity that is lighting up our rooms right now. Okay, but is it the electrons moving, creating the magnetic field or the magnetic field generating the electrons movement? It's, it's a self-perpetuating, self-energizing dynamo energized by the material movement of the, the uh, core fluid because of getting rid of the heat that's down there. Okay, thanks. Well, I think that's the idea with the sun, isn't it? The mo motion of the plasma, but it's happening all over the sun. So you end up with multiple magnetic fields, as I understand yeah. it. I'll but it, it it's, it's electrons moving that is yeah. actually what we are seeing up here on the surface of the earth yeah. it's there are no ions it's it's, it's a it's there's there's no ion ionized particles down there okay. something to cover more of um uh, malcolm had asked to say some things but i don't I think he's here any longer. No, I think he had to leave. Okay, so um, Joe, were you going to talk about Astro Cafe mugs? And we could talk about Astro Cafe. Okay, let's see if I can. Oh dear. I don't know what happened here. My share seems to be broken. I'll just talk. Um, I guess I could go get a mug. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm selling um, Astra Cafe mugs. I put a small order into Vistaprint. Um, it has the uh, logo, Astra Cafe logos on one side. It has Victoria Center uh, words on the other side. It's a white porcelain mug. And I sent a little promo out about it um, about a week ago. And uh, the mugs will arrive in about seven days. So if anyone would like one, they're $15 each. And you need to pay me, and then I'll pay the Victoria Center the proceeds. Oh, there it is. Thank you, Randy, for the help. Yeah, so it's um, they're nice mugs. And uh, we'll, 
we'll sell them until they're gone. So um, you don't have to hit me up right away if you don't want to. Um, we will have Astronomy Cafe in person shortly. And uh, when that happens, uh, I'll have some with me. So you can buy one then if you wish to. But if you want to put your name in for one, make sure you get one. By all means, let me know. You can uh, drop it in the chat, or you can email me at uh, web at victoria.rask.ca. Laurie, you have a question. Um, yes, could we give some of these mugs to our speakers? You certainly can. I put the question to council. They haven't answered me yet. Um, how many they were? Right. Okay. And Les? Yes, Joe, you may have this knowledge at hand. Why is there an accent over the E of cafe? And why is it not astronomical cafe? <laughs> I have no idea why we have an accent over cafe. Um, I think that probably just came up in the font when I typed it in, and, and, and there it stuck. <laughs> well, we'll probably have to we'll probably have to ask uh, Sandy Barda. Um, I think she first coined coined the term. She did. She when, was the first host. Yeah, it's Many years ago. It's an accent aigu or circumflex or one of those. <laughs> cafe. Who is Sandy Barta, and when did she do that? Well, this goes back to when uh, I was president, Randy. This is many, many, many years ago. Um, uh, Sandy and I were a bit of a tag team in those days. Uh, we actually did um, uh, star interpretation at the Oak Bay Beach Hotel uh, from kayaks, if you want to believe that. So it was actually called Crescent Moon. And uh, we played the uh, country mouse, uh, city mouse uh, shtick. So uh, basically, uh, uh, Sandy never had a lot of money to uh, to work on astronomical things, so she built everything herself. So she built uh, her own Dobsonian scope, which she brought along with her. And of course, I always had uh, more money than I had brains. So uh, <laughs> uh, typically, I could afford most of these things. Uh, but yeah, so we, we played that through uh, at Oak Bay Beach, and uh, she actually hosted for a long time uh, in View Royal uh astro cafe and uh beginners would come by and uh, we would uh come and just kind of shoot the breeze we would look at equipment uh we'd discuss astronomy just like we do here it was very informal when uh sandy was hosting it at her place both in view royal and when she moved to uh souk and it sort of petered out in souk because not too many people wanted to drive all that way and then bruno took it over and uh so we met in uh in Gordon Head for quite a while at his place before it became more formal, shall we say. And as you know it today. In rented quarters. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. With audio visuals and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, but the 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 theme of it is still pretty well the same, actually. Except uh, in the early days we never had um uh, uh presentations. So that that came much later. Uh a lot of it was just kind of shooting the breeze and um, e eating Sandy's uh, baking goods. Gary, you have a question? Yes, uh, Joe, when we present these mugs, we should present them as the highly coveted Astro Cafe mugs. Absolutely, just the way uh, Reg did with the, um, the beer mugs and uh, exactly. other memorabilia. The memorabilia is very precious as far as Absolutely. I'm concerned. Well, there, there's not that many of them around. I mean, how many have you made over the years, right? They're not. Yeah, well, this match is only 20 and I probably had made about the same amount before and that's all that uh, was available, so. But it is coveted. <laughs> it is to me anyway. <laughs> um, while we're on the subject, um, Randy, Joe and I will be um, at the site uh, tomorrow evening to, um, uh, take our TV off the wall of where it is currently and prepare for it to go to its new location. Um, all, uh, we have a guest speaker next week, so I don't want to disrupt anything. So um, we're looking at maybe, and we'll have to see what's um, happening of trying to host Zoom from there. So rather than having people come to us, 
Um, we might try and see if the network even supports doing Zoom from there with just a few of us there. Um, so maybe by the end of the month. Um, our initial test to the networks uh, from there, the connection seems to be good, but it would be nice to, um, uh, to actually try it out and make sure that it in fact does work. Um, so that's kind of where we are at the moment. Um, but what would be kind of interesting to know is uh, if we do open the doors to people coming in person, how many people are interested in doing that? So just show of hands, I guess. I'm seeing quite a few hands waving. So yeah, okay. I mean, there's, you know, we'll have to see, um, you know, how it works out. And, uh, and certainly we'll have to see what happens over the next month because it's, uh, the, the trends don't seem to be great at the moment, if, especially if you see what's happening in, I think it's Ontario in particular, but, um, you know, we'll play it by ear. And, and certainly as um, has been mentioned earlier, that if, uh, you know, we'll probably recommend that people wear masks and things like that, except when, you know, I think we still want to make coffee and stuff too, so. Yeah. But, uh, and certainly we'd like to, um, see if we can keep a virtual aspect because then people can continue to attend from outside the immediate area. So, but we'll have to see, <laughs> we have to see if that actually can work. And if there's enough, you know, if there's enough person power to actually make this happen too, because it'd be nice to, uh, you know, this will take more people. Does anybody have any comments about that? Well, we've mentioned this before, but we should mention it again that uh, if anyone else, uh, we. We won't thank. We've only had one person volunteer so far to uh, help with uh, Astronomy Cafe. We could certainly use some more help. Yeah, if a bunch of uh, old guys with the uh, golden rods and reels can uh, figure out how to make it work, uh, we should be able to manage. <laughs> there are essentially two roles. We're hoping for one group of people who will host, who will be, you know, kind of the Chris person person and then somebody who will mind the equipment and make sure that we're recording and that the people at home are uh, are receiving the information so kind of the the joe car person and we figure that we're going to need both people every time and that is uh you know ideally we would have five people of each flavor so that uh, it's not too onerous. And I just want to say again, how indebted we are to Chris and Joe for having made the Astro Cafe such a satisfying uh, experience for the last two years. Thanks, Randy. Yeah, so basically, if you, um, if you feel you can help there, um, basically, you know, for example, the whole stroll in an in-person cafe would be to have the key, basically, or to be able to get in there and to get people coordinated to get things set up and then to basically do what, what you see happening here. Okay, who's next? And kind of can just keep the flow going in the evening. And uh, we then need somebody to be monitoring Zoom, as Randy said, and making sure that we're not losing the people who are not in the room. And that's why we've got to test to see if that can even work well from that site. There are possibly some issues to deal with and we'll have to see how it works. One of the things is gonna be sound, I think. So we are a little concerned about having a, a decent enough microphone that um, uh, people on Zoom can hear the people in the room. Great. Well, we'll keep you posted as we move along with that. And uh, we hopefully will have the, uh, the TV in its new location um, in the coming weeks, but we do need to confirm what bracket we need for the back of it. So we need to take it off the wall first. We'll try and accomplish that tomorrow. Great. Um, so I heard via the chat that Martin had some photos. Uh, would you like to show us what you've got? I was just gonna say, Chris, uh, sure. at a place where I work, they have a larger room and they've been doing a lot of people zooming in with like 20 30 people in the room 
and they've got some sort of microphone that they've put on their laptop that allows you to have directional choice on it. And I'll find out what that is. It seems to pick up really well in a large room because it can like focus on someone, but it can also then be very omnidirectional as well. And if I can figure out what that is, I'll let you know. I don't know if it's cheap or what. Yeah, as you know, as Chris points out, audio is key. Um, it's if the people that are online are are just going to going to book out uh, if they can't hear, <laughs> so we need to solve that problem. So yeah. appreciate your input. <laughs> yeah, that would be good to know about that. I'll ask I tomorrow and see what I can get for you. Sure, thank you. Yeah, and I'm sorry I should have asked for any further comments, but then Martin, we're ready for you, I think. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, am I uh, am I up? Am I? Can you hear me? You can all hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, yes. Further to, uh, uh, I don't see me as as big. I'm going to hold something up. Um, further to Randy's excellent uh, sun stuff. <laughs> That's the science scientific phrase for the sun stuff. Uh, I read this a, a couple of years ago. Uh, it's by Dr. Melanie Windridge. She is a plasma physicist, and it's a, it's a popular science book, um, so it's not deep into the science, but it's about her journeys around the world trying to track down uh, the aurora. Uh, and I remember it as being a kind of an interesting read. Uh, that green screen effect is killing it, but it's called, it's called Aurora by uh, Melanie Windridge. Uh, quite interesting. I had another book recommended before I got started as well. I just read this. It's by uh, Patricia Caraveo, who is with the National Institute of Astrophysics in Milan. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a thin sort of book about, um, about light pollution. Um, and it's, uh, it doesn't cover a lot of new ground, but what is kind of interesting about it is, um, oh man, it's frustrating. What is interesting about it is it's, is it's up to date enough to cover uh, both the, the changes to the night sky that were engendered during the pandemic uh, and also changes to the night sky and the challenges uh, because of the um, Starlink and stuff. There you go, it's just popping up there. Patrizio Caraveo. Interestingly, the, um, the, the Italian, she's Italian, the Italian title of the book is uh, sky for, uh, The Sky for Everyone, I think. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting if anybody's into the night sky stuff. Um, yeah, I just had a couple of uh, uh, pictures. Um, let's just uh, let me get to this. Hopefully, you're all seeing uh, this. Ooh. So um, I got uh, I got a new telescope um, back in this mid December, and uh, uh, it's a much bigger telescope than I've ever had. It's also my first mirror telescope. And uh, of course, because I've just bought a new telescope, I was not able to see a night sky for about two and a half months. Uh, so I'm just starting to get used to it. Um, and this is just a quick flick through some recent pictures. So uh, Messier 13, the, the uh, globular cluster in, in Hercules. Uh, this has all been shot in the last, um, I would say last two or three weeks, three or four weeks, maybe. Um, all of this is, is all a work in progress. I'm working you know, for anybody that remembers the talk I gave last November, you know, I, I come from a photographic background, so I'm still learning the photography for this. This I'm still learning the, the um, uh, you know, the, the sort of the, the methodologies to, to produce the best images I can from the data I get. Uh, but this is all from this eight inch um, Celestron uh, uh, schmidt cassegrain So this is the, the Needle Galaxy. Uh, Messier 106. Um, a lot of challenges that I'm uh, that I'm trying to work through, uh, not least with trying to figure out how to to make this big mirror telescope work, but kind of quite a lot of fun as well. Uh, this just for fun. This is obviously not shot through the Schmidt gas grain. I shot this this week. Um, I saw that the um, I use uh, one of the the, uh, the Sky Guide apps I use uh, told me that there was International Space Station was coming over within the next five minutes. And I ran in and got, uh, or I had a camera that was sitting on a, tele on a tripod anyway, ran outside, 
manually focused, pointed it to where I knew it was going to be. And, uh, and, and I posted this picture online because I thought it was kind of interesting because right now there are three Americans, one German and three Russians on board that thing. And they all appear to be getting on just fine. And uh, it would be nice if that was, uh, if that was something that could spread to uh, earthbound pursuits. Um, this one too, from this uh, recent, uh, this was from like three or four nights ago. So this is uh, a wide field view. This was shot with a little red cat um, telescope, which is a little 50 millimeter uh, Petzval lens uh, refractor. And uh, this is quite a challenge because there's a lot of stars in this field. So you have to try and get rid of the stars as well. But it just it just blows my mind uh, when you get these wide field shots with all the galaxies. And I ran a quick uh, plate solvent annotation through astrometry, and those are those are all galaxies in that picture. So it just uh, I'll go back to it. Martin, great uh, shot of Mercurian's chain there. Thanks. Yeah, I did, did a closer field one with a slightly bigger refractor the week before, but I got more time on it with the red cap this week. Um, and uh, also for anybody that's not familiar with, uh, hang on, let me go back, not familiar with um, with this area, uh, this is the, I don't know, if, can you guys see my cursor when I'm doing this? Yep. This, this galaxy here, M87, is the one that uh, the Event Horizon team photographed uh, to get the first picture of the, of the, the black hole. Um, David, you got your hand up. Did you have a question? Uh, yes. Um... Martin, for the C8 shots, um, were you using a reducer at all? Or were you shooting at uh, F10? No, I'm just shooting it uh, at, at its regular prime F10. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, M87 and, and uh, Virgo, Gallic, Virgo A and all that kind of stuff. It's just a quick one I did. I have a, I have a real fondness for the Flaming Star Nebula area. Uh, and this was just, I, I just managed to get a few frames on IC405 uh, in that area. This is, it's pretty noisy, but it's just, uh, it's just such a fun area. I like, uh, I like photographing that. Uh, and then it's just a quick picture of M101. Uh, the, that's the Whirlpool, right? I see a 101, is it called the Whirlpool? I think it is. Um, and then I've been going back through some old stuff. And one of the things that's fascinating to me is old stuff and new stuff. So uh, improvements and stuff. So this is when I first started doing astrophotography back at the end of 2019, I got some very quick shots of this, of uh, Messier 42 and, and the Orion Nebula. And they're not very good. Uh, I, I processed the heck out of it to get as much out of it as I could. But if you go in pretty close, uh, you'll see it's pretty noisy and the stars are... Uh, are not uh, not exactly round. Uh, and the amazing thing for me is I have not been able to get a clear shot at Messier 42 since that time. Didn't get one at all in the winter of 2020 or, or most of the winter of 2021. And it's pretty low down in the sky right now, but I just put a, 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 a telescope on a few nights ago and just gave it a shot anyway. So this is, uh, this is a, a later shot of that. And uh, if you go into closer detail on that, there's much less noise. It's just fascinating to, to me to, to see how far you can go, uh, you know, once you start really applying all the things you've learned over the time. Uh, same, um, same, and, op same optics, uh, Martin? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Mm. Probably not. I think, the, I think the old ones were probably shot with uh, just a regular uh, 70 to 200 uh, camera lens uh, and then this one was shot with um, my old William Optics Zenistar 80mm refractor. Yeah so photo but shot on again? Uh, photo optics versus uh, telescopic optics. So the first one was shot on, on camera optics, second one on a telescope yeah um, and all shot with uh, Nikon DSLRs. Everything's DSLR in here by the way. Um, and then this was a shot of, um, this is one that I worked really, really hard on last year. Um, last April, I shot five nights and, and produced about six hours of data and I, I, I worked it really hard. And then I've just reworked that data again 
uh, into this. It's a, I find it's a really difficult framing to do from a photographic point of view because it's kind of the two galaxies are not quite close enough to smoosh together into one nice frame. And there's that third galaxy in the top. So this is the first time I've tried it with the vertical uh, framing on this. Uh, but this one I used a different uh, normalization tool uh, to try and use more of the 17 hours of data that I actually shot on this. Uh, and this is uh, this is just something I was working on this afternoon. So that's the processing of that, uh, just in a bit more close up detail. And then I just thought for grins a couple of weeks ago, I pointed that uh, eight inch at, uh, at Messier 81 and uh, just got a few frames on that. Um, and it's amazing just how much more how much more data you pull down in a short space of time using eight inches of aperture instead of uh, instead of eighty millimeters, which is just three inches, of course. Mm. And then, um, uh, yeah, that's it. So let's just end it on that. Good job there, Martin. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Thanks. Really well. Uh, Martin, nice. Martin, this is one of the newer uh, C8s, right? It's the Edge. It's the Edge HD. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and I've got it on a on a C Gem two mount. Which uh, which is going to be for sale very quickly to whoever needs a <laughs> whoever needs a bigger mount because uh, it's it's not it's not it's not my favorite mount. Let's be honest. It works fine. I'm sure for for, for visual observers it's probably great, and for uh, uh, for some people it might be. I, I just I just I want a different mount. I didn't want that mount, but I got it as part of the bundle with the. Um, so there's going to be a cheap C gem mount going very shortly. So what are you looking at? What are you going to replace it with? Uh, Ioptron. Uh, I, I have my uh, I have a little Ioptron CM twenty five P, and I get insane guide numbers on that. Um, this week I was getting point uh, zero four and point zero four across right ascension and declination. And the thing I like about the Ioptrons is that they offer a much better mount weight uh, load capacity to the actual weight of the of the the, the the mount as well so yeah i want to get one of those that's it that's it for me great thank you thanks very much martin i think that's all we had on the list tonight unless anybody else has any final comments or did i miss anybody Okay, well, next week we have um, Chris Bohr from the Nanaimo Astronomy uh, Society. Uh, he's going to, uh, he's been very interested in the Apollo missions over the years. And uh, so he visited, um, I think it was Johnson, is it the, yeah, whichever one, Johnson Space Center, I think. And uh, a few years ago, pre pandemic, and he's going to talk about that trip and some of the astronauts he's met over the years. So it should be interesting. Plus, we should then have some time if there's anything else uh, for this evening. And I guess updates about other ongoing things, such as our preparations for um, International Astronomy Day um, and anything else that comes up. So anything else we need to know tonight or are we are we done? <laughs> going, going. OK, well, good night, everyone. And thanks for joining us and uh, hopefully see you next week. Great. Thanks.